Hey yo, and what is up, gang? Thank you for checking out Sledgehammer TV tonight. Monday Night Raw, six days away from the Elimination Chamber on the road to WrestleMania, has their champion pinned in the main event during a gauntlet match that was all filler, no thriller, and was completely and utterly useless and nothing more than a waste of time to establish something that should have already been established very easily. We are going to talk about that and so much more. The Bad Bunny stuff. The Lacey Evans big bombshell announcement. And so much more right here and right now. My name is Nick Nightmare. You are watching the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show's Monday Night Raw Review and Reaction Show. Let's do it. <laughs> I got pregnant. I can't fight Oscar at the Illumination Chamber. Bam, bam, let's all be happy and celebrate now because she's going away. Bam, 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 bam. Oh, oh, sorry, I didn't know that I hit record. I was just going off on the best thing about Monday Night Raw tonight. Lacey Evans is going away, everybody. She is not pregnant with Ric Flair's love child. She is actually pregnant with a child given to her by her real-life husband, and congratulations. I am so happy for her. I hope for the best for her and her family in the future. It was the best news of the night because of two reasons. One, she's going to have to take a long and extended vacation, quite possibly have to make the decision to possibly not even come back at all which would be good for most wrestling fans who are not big fans of the Lacey Evans character. The other good thing about it is that there's no way now that Sunday comes and Lacey Evans beats Asuka for the championship, which we all pretty much knew was coming. It was written on the wall. There would be no other reason to give her Ric Flair as a manager unless that was the plan. But now, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? She can't wrestle, obviously. She's carrying a little one inside of her, so that takes precedent, and you must protect the child at all costs. So don't even fuck around. Don't even pretend. Don't play. Don't jeopardize anything. If this is 100% legit and real, as everybody is reporting it is, keep her away from the ring and get Ric Flair away from her immediately immediately. We're not fucking stupid. They should treat us like we're not stupid. This is not 1985. Everybody knows what's going on. People that follow Lacey Evans for whatever reason on Twitter and everything are going to all be privy to this information. We are more backstage now as fans than we have ever been. I wish they would treat us like we were intelligent fucking fans and that we knew what was going on and that we were hip and smart and in the know because we are. We are. So don't treat us like jackasses. The same thing can be said with how they opened this show with a Miz TV segment that had no purpose other than for the Miz to remove himself from the Elimination Chamber match. I wish I had a song and dance for the Miz that I could do because I'm super duper happy about that too. We talked about it last week, man. The Miz looked like a jackass for even putting himself in the Elimination Chamber because you have the Money in the Bank briefcase. You are ruining, you are ruining your, your chances of being successful even with the Money in the Bank briefcase by putting yourself through an Elimination Chamber matchup. He didn't know whether he was going to be first, second, last, but it would have been so dumb so dumb and then he wants to call himself a master strategist when for the last week you looked like a complete jerk off okay so the Miz is not going to be in the elimination chamber this is great 
This is great. The bad thing about the Miz TV segment that started this whole shit show off was Drew McIntyre was the guest, right? And just follow me along with this for one second. The Miz is being the Miz, and he's getting in Drew's face, and Drew McIntyre fucking wants him. I'm fired up. I think I dropped about six F-bombs already, and that's not usually the case. But man, this show is so terrible, it's got my, my adrenaline flowing. And it's because of reasons like this. Because you got the Miz in there, and he talks shit to Drew, and then Drew's like, listen, bro, if uh, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but he's like, listen, if you say something, I'm about to talk, if you interrupt me, it's going to be trouble for you. And of course, the Miz being the Miz, Drew McIntyre starts to speak. For some reason, he keeps calling him Andy. Is his name Andrew? Is his full name Andrew, or are we just doing this? Or maybe The Miz just got finished watching fucking Toy Story before he showed up at the arena tonight. Andy. Guy's name is Drew. Whatever. Whatever. So, long story short, let's wrap this segment up because it's not even worth this much time. Drew McIntyre headbutted The Miz. Full force. And it looked like it fucking hurt. It looked bad. It looked really bad. But then... Drew McIntyre leaves The Miz. The Miz gets up and then gives this whole little diatribe as if he never even got hit. If you just got headbutted by Drew McIntyre, I'm pretty sure you wouldn't be able to tell me what's two and two. If I said, what's two plus two, Mr. Guy that just got your head knocked in by Drew McIntyre? Seventeen! Seventeen is the answer because you would be completely knocked out. They do things like this that make wrestling look silly. The guy just got a full-on headbutt. It was almost like going head-to-head with a bull. And you got knocked the frig out. And you get up and talk like nothing, and he gets all intense, and he starts yelling, and you should be slightly concussed. Sell the injury. Don't just rub it at the end of your promo. Oh, right. I got headbutted in the face. Let me rub my face a little bit. Come on, man. Come on. And to make matters even worse, what do they do? What do they do to fill the Miz's empty spot? Well, the Miz automatically thinks it's going to go to John Morrison. Why? He's not a former WWE champion. Not in the heavyweight main title capacity anyway. He doesn't even qualify based on the parameters set for entry into the match. Enter into the scenario Kofi Kingston. Kofi Kingston, former world heavyweight champion, thanks to the whole Kofi mania thing that happened two years ago, and his argument is just, hey, listen, Adam Pearce, you bald dumbass. I am a former WWE champion. You just placed all these other champions in there. Why can't I just go in there? I can solve your problem right now but then again the miz has to get involved and next thing you know they're arguing and for some un unknown godforsaken reason adam pierce decides that even though john morrison is not on the show tonight because he's off recording a diss track to diss bad bunny which i already don't want to hear do not play that song on monday night raw I don't want to hear it. Okay, so now he's going to have John Morrison versus Kofi Kingston. Kofi Kingston now, the only man in the Elimination Chamber that had to gain entry via qualification. He had to have a preliminary match to prove he was worthy, despite the fact that he fits the parameters to gain entry into the match without having to wrestle. But I digress. He makes Morrison's... Uh, shot into the chamber have to go through The Miz. So The Miz tonight is going to wrestle Kofi Kingston. Miz wins, Morrison's in. Kofi wins, he's in the chamber on Sunday. What kind of stupid retardedness is this? Haven't we just spent the last, I don't know, six weeks or so embroiled in this feud between Retribution and The New Day. Don't you think with all of the things that Mustafa Ali has been saying over the last couple of weeks, especially 
targeting towards Kofi Kingston, pointing him out, calling him out for taking his spot two years ago, saying things like, if I never get hurt, Kofi Mania never happens. This is real life stuff that happened. This would make interesting TV. You kind of slowed it by making the, this Retribution New Day thing, but here you have a prime opportunity. The Elimination Chamber is where Kofi Mania was practically born. And it was all because he was replacing Mustafa Ali. And now Kofi Kingston has a qualifying match on Monday Night Raw tonight versus The Miz. Why? Why wasn't it Mustafa Ali? Why wasn't it the two of them battling it out? Playing off of their history, which all culminates around WrestleMania season, and is the story you idiots have actually been telling us for the last couple of weeks, and now we're just going to forget all about it? And then Retribution doesn't even show up on the show at all? Has no... Uh, has no way to get involved in the match, maybe cost Kofi Kingston the match, or try to cost him the match, and then Kofi could win despite Mustafa Ali trying to keep him out, extenuating the rivalry, building it up, building up a little more so that you can have a payoff match at WrestleMania that would mean something and make sense, because we all know Kofi Kingston is not winning the Elimination Chamber. So use the situation to create this story that can still give you a great WrestleMania match. And tonight you could have done it by, if you didn't want to have Ali versus Kofi, you should have had Retribution. At least try, at least try to screw over Kofi during his match. Or, at the very least, you could have been the reason why he lost in his match in the gauntlet tonight. WWE has got a hard on for gauntlets. They know they did a couple of good ones, so now they're just going to keep throwing them at us. Because they probably had a few segments written. Some fucking genius in the back was like, oh, Lacey Evans is pregnant. Let's do a whole Ric Flair's the daddy thing. Okay. And then some other idiots said, oh, let's do this shit for the Illumination Chamber. And blah, blah, blah. And we're like, oh, okay. That's how they write this show. That's how they freaking write this show. Bunch of idiots in the back doing all this stuff. But they can't come up with good stuff. They can't come up with something as easily as I just did for you. Everything is there. Right on the table for you. But it's like they're refusing to do the easy things. And they want to make things difficult. And the last idiot in the back raises his hand. Oh, Mr. McMahon, sir. M -m -m Mr. McMahon, sir. Mr. Bruce, sir. Oh, what is it, useless peon writer? Uh, sir, we only have enough content to make it to 10 p.m., sir. I don't give a shit, Bruce. What do we do? Well, Vince, let's have a gauntlet match. It'll fill time. We'll give six men. Every match will have a nice amount of time. It can fill the whole last hour of the show. Oh, I like it. Bruce. You brilliant bastard. That's an inside look for you guys on how this show is fucking written. All right, let's let's move it along because we got to get to this gauntlet match. A whole bunch of other useless shit happened on this show tonight, like the mandatory weekly six-man tag team matchup. This week, it was a ridiculous teaming of Matt Riddle and the Loser House Party. Versus the Hurt Business, again, the Hurt Business, one of the better things on Monday Night Raw, and here we are tonight, they lose, they lose to Matt Riddle and the Loser House Party, after we have to see Matt Riddle before the match in that little gorilla position segment, which I really fucking hate, by the way, and he's talking to the Looster House Party, and because it's President's Day, he wants to talk about his favorite president. He wants to talk about Martin Van Buren, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, and then he says Harrison Ford because he's so stoned and he's so stupid that he doesn't realize Harrison Ford, the actor, was not actually a president in that movie where he played the president, Air Force One. Which, again, is a movie from, like, 30 years ago. So I bet a lot of people 
who don't know Harrison Ford's career, like a lot of the young people probably watching and don't even know Harrison Ford for being Han Solo, is like, Harrison Ford? Was that the president before Richard Nixon? What kind of corny shit is this? And then the loser house party have to tell him that his, who their favorite president was. And he's like, oh, well, all the presidents are great. And then they go out and have this match. Was that necessary? Do we have to keep showing segments that make Matt Riddle look like a completely half-retarded man-child? It's ridiculous. It's not funny. I mean, at least if you were writing funny comedy and Matt Riddle made me laugh, I would tell you. But this is essentially the same joke week after week for a guy who should not be a comedy act. This is a former MMA guy. A, a man that earned my respect through his efforts at NXT because I was never really big on Matt Riddle. I thought he was overrated and overhyped. And then I seen him in NXT and I was like, you know what? I can get on board this, this Riddle train. And then the Riddle train pulled into the fucking main roster and was pulled apart. The wheels were thrown over there. The little smokestack was thrown over there. The conductor was murdered. Because this is not the Matt Riddle. We all know. Hell, his name's not even Matt anymore. What is the point of this show? Zero. Zero point to anything about this show. And then, of course, we had to end the match with Bobby Lashley coming up from behind and scooping up Matt Riddle in the hurt lock like we haven't seen that every single week for the last, I don't know, what, two months or so? I don't know. Everything's just blending into one another and it all feels the same to me. We had to give the Miz more TV time. He was in the back complaining that his briefcase was dented. Because this is what we need to talk about during a three-hour fucking wrestling show. He thanked Adam Pearce for the chance to be in the chamber. He wanted to give it to a young up-and-comer. He thought Morrison should take his spot. We glazed over this a little bit at the beginning. Then all of a sudden, Mandy Rose is in the back. She's talking to the bad bunny, who I still don't know. That doesn't mean he's not a superstar. And I will continue to say I don't have a disdain for Bad Bunny. I don't know who he is. I don't know one way or another. I have no reason to hate on him. I have no reason to like him being on this show either. It, for a guy, if you know who Bad Bunny is and you're enjoying this, I'm happy for you and I hope you're getting the most enjoyment out of it. I really do. I hope in your eyes it makes Damian Priest look fucking great. Because to guys like me, and to me specifically, I mean, I really should only talk for myself, but I know if you are not familiar with this guy, it's, it's almost as if they just took some random Joe off the street and was like, hey, you with the weird man buns on your head, come over here. You want to be on the show tonight? You haven't been to New York or in L.A. or a big city. You've been walking down the street and you got some guy like trying to give you tickets to a comedy show. Hey, what are you doing tonight? Come take these free tickets. They're trying to fill up. The That's what I feel like they did. They had a guy from WWE out on the Hey, who wants to be on Monday Night Raw tonight? We'll take this skinny, good-looking young gentleman. Look, he stands out. He's got three weirdly placed buns on his head. Let's put him on Monday night. Oh, oh, what? You're Puerto Rican? Oh, that's even better. We're going to take you and put you with the only other Puerto Rican guy on the roster because, you know, that's what they do in WWE. Everything's got to be about race and nationality and we all have to have cliques and groups that, you know, we don't have to blend together. We all just have to keep to our own kind. This is a great idea. This is good shit, Bruce. Whew. Oh, my God. Then they want to tell us he's going to be on Saturday Night Live this week. Bad Bunny's going to be on Saturday Night Live performing this week. Do you know what I'm not watching on Saturday? Saturday Night Live. Because I don't care. I don't care. This is where Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods come out of nowhere and and change everything and get in the Miz's face and end up in this match for, Mar for Morrison's entry and it's Kofi versus the Miz. I don't care. I don't care. Mustafa Ali not being involved or him not being in this match was a travesty. And I think that would have been an infinitely better idea. There is nothing in the world... 
that you could tell me to sell me on everything they've been doing in this disgusting, poor excuse for a women's division. First of all, before I was privy to the knowledge that Lacey Evans was actually pregnant, I was quite disgusted by all of this. Not because we're being led to believe that she had sex with a 70-year-old raisin-bald Ric Flair. That doesn't bother me. He's Ric Flair. Woo! Space Mountain and all that. It's something you could believe, right? But what I, what I couldn't fathom is why they would do this six days out from a title match other than the fact that there was just going to be mind games being played between Lacey and Charlotte. She's trying to get in Charlotte's head. She's trying to freak her out. As you could see in the thumbnail, that was the face of Charlotte Flair. After all of this pregnancy hogwash came to be. And I just didn't understand it. I didn't understand it at all. Then I started to see on social media the repeat, the, the reports, the repeats, the reports that she was actually pregnant. So, you know, now you don't want to be negative about it. You don't want to shit all over her. I'm not going to do that. Being pregnant is a beautiful, magical thing. And congratulations. Fantastic. But now what do we do? Now what do we do? These, these are those dumbasses in the back. Oh, Mr. McMahon, sir. Lacey's pregnant. What do we do, sir? Oh, let's say it's Rick's baby. But, so she has a title match. I don't care about that right now. Write me a segment where Rick can tell Charlotte he's a baby daddy. Instead of collecting your heads together, getting your guys together and coming up and formulating a plan to tell the world... A, Lacey Evans is pregnant and she's being removed from the match. And B, who's going to be replacing her come Sunday? Or are they just pulling the match all together? Is Asuka just not fighting now? Are they going to turn it into a tag match? Because God forbid we have Asuka on the TV without something to do with Charlotte. And while we're on this topic, how many times is Charlotte Flair going to take a gigantic peacock-sized dump on Asuka's title reigns? All for ridiculous stories that have nothing to do with the championship. Do you hear Charlotte talking about being the woman's champion right now? Right now she's being tortured by her old man and bam, bam, Lacey Evans. And now that's all going away. So now you wrote yourself into a corner. What's he going to do now? What's he going to do now? Go and, and apologize to Charlotte. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. We're going to get crying Ric Flair back on Monday Night Raw again? We ain't got no time for that. And apparently, they ain't got no time for Asuka. Because they didn't care enough to tell any of us, and probably not even her, what they're going to do instead. Are they going to default give the title shot to Peyton Royce? Is that why they all of a sudden reignited this tag team tonight? Or are they going to just go straight to Asuka versus Charlotte? Because I, we all had the big feeling that Asuka was dropping the belt this Sunday. And now WWE's scrambling for plans and what to do. But instead of focusing on that, they want to play, you know, All My Children. They want to do Days of Our Lives. They want to do ridiculous storylines that nobody's going to believe because we all already know the truth. You can't suspend my disbelief when Ryan Satin and this one and that one is on Twitter telling everybody, oh no, she's really pregnant. And you know it's not Rick's baby. You got to treat the fans and the industry itself with just a little bit of respect. And when things happen for real that are going to send things out of whack, you just have to come out and tell us, hey, look, things went out of whack. This girl got pregnant. We have to change gears. We would be more accepting of that than we would watching Ric Flair. Woo! I'm a daddy. I'm going to be a daddy again. Let me smack myself up. Are you kidding me? There's no way they can play this out. No way. Just like the whole spider shit with Eric Rowan. You can't play this out to the end. 
This is what they're focusing on in the women's division. This is important. No, it is not. This is what you call garbage. Garbage. And the tag team match that followed was a complete waste of time. Complete waste of time. Raw women's champion Asuka and Charlotte taking on Peyton and Lacey. As soon as Lacey was about to get in the ring, everything comes to an end. Charlotte Flair standing there looking all despondent and confused because Lacey's pregnant. She never said that Rick was the father. All she said was that she was pregnant as she stood there in her clown pants and, and everything. <sighs> but man, so I guess it was a no contest because there was no bell. There was nothing. Rick Flair's just like, call me daddy, woo! And then the music played and it was over. That's the best they got. Off. Kofi Kingston, as we talked about also earlier, defeated The Miz. He gained entry into the Elimination Chamber matchup. A tad underwhelming. I keep seeing everybody talking about, oh, this is one of the best Miz matches ever. You know what? I don't care. I don't care. The Miz has overstayed his welcome. That character needs to go away. It's just not interesting. It's not entertaining. And it's worn out its welcome. It's the same shit every week. And now you're going to go from this to him being with Morrison, fighting Damian Priest and Bad Bunny at WrestleMania. And I couldn't care less about any of it. So we're going to move right along. They aired a replay of the My Hole. My Hole. The My Hole incident from last week. I wish we would just get over this whole thing. I didn't need to hear all their stupid fucking puns. And I didn't need to see her stupid face do it again. I was already reminded of it when they tried to recreate it on SmackDown. I'm glad they didn't try to recreate it again. Which was the only good thing that came out of the segment they had tonight. Shayna Baszler defeating Lana. I didn't even pay attention. I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't watch this match, not one minute of it, because you expect me to give a shit about Lana now? Not going to happen. I don't care how many tables you put her through. I don't care that she accidentally won last week. I don't care that she hurt Nia's butthole. I don't care. She, much like The Miz, is a remnant from another time when she was part of something that used to be cool. And now just needs to pack it up and go away. Because the Lana character is useless. She's about on the same level as a Tamina Snuka. There is no reason for you to be around. And if she beat Shayna Baszler tonight, I was going to be really pissed off. It pissed me off enough that she lost thanks to a distraction. You think Shayna Baszler needs a distraction to beat Lana? Then you're fucking burnt. And you're burnt and you shouldn't be writing a script for the WWE. Where'd you get your diploma? From from Romper Room? Is it written out in crayon? Ridiculous. I'll tell you this. The best part of Monday Night Raw tonight was every time they showed a commercial for the new rock show. The Young Rock show that's going to be on NBC. Going to be a way better wrestling show than an actual wrestling show like Monday Night Raw. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Then... We get Braun Strowman. Braun Strowman shows up. He wants to know why he wasn't put in the Elimination Chamber match. And, you know, he was a former Universal Champion. But you were never a WWE Champion, right? The, you, the whole thing is you had to be a former WWE Champion. And did he forget that he was sick? Did he forget that he had a blood problem he had a, uh, an infection in his blood and he lost 15 pounds and you know he was going through something detrimental to his physical health that we are all aware of once again it's like the wwe thinks we don't follow our own social media feeds we all know where he was why doesn't he know where he was why is he asking why am i not in this match when obviously you haven't been on tv in weeks because you were nearly dying somewhere why do you make your people look so dumb why do you make your fans feel so dumb 
talk about dumb. Strowman decides he's going to go to Shane McMahon. Shane McMahon. Shane McMahon, who's not on the show tonight, thank God. We're not going to see him before the Elimination Chamber. So now I'm going to expect that at the pay-per-view, Shane's going to be there and somehow Braun's going to be inserted. What, are they going to have a special seventh pod hung from the top of the chamber? Is he going to be hiding from under the ring like the big show? Does it make sense to any of you? Did you enjoy any of this show tonight? No, you didn't. No, you didn't. I will say this. The third hour was a decent hour because the gauntlet matches, for whatever reason, always tend up Always turn out, end up, tend up, whatever, to be very good. All right, the action is good. And that could be attributed to the amount of talent that was placed in the ring. This would only serve to be a precursor to the Elimination Chamber this week. It started off with AJ Styles and Kofi Kingston. AJ Styles would beat Kofi Kingston, which made sense. It made sense because Kofi had already fought once in this night. He had a long match with The Miz at the start of the show. He went almost over 10 minutes with AJ Styles here where he got his leg just absolutely worked over 100%. And he ended up getting hit with the phenomenal forearm and dropping, getting the loss to AJ Styles, who would move on in the gauntlet. And next would come out the champ. The champ, Drew McIntyre. You know what? You know what I forgot to mention? The one really bad thing about this gauntlet match is not that it was just an hour filler match. It's because as the champion, as the WWE champion, you should already, by right, have the option or have the first pick over being the one to enter last. At the very least, you should be able to choose when you want to go in. You want to be a fighting champion? You want to go in number one and take everybody out? That's on you. You want to wait? Let everybody beat themselves up? That's on you. It should be your champion, uh, your championship privilege to choose your spot in this match, especially if you're defending your title in this scenario. Why did he have to decide when he was going to... Why did anybody need this? It, it, it isn't needed. Does going in sixth really give anybody an advantage? I would love to know the statistics with all the Elimination Chamber matches that we've ever had. How many people that have entered at number six have actually gone on to win the Elimination Chamber? That's a great question. Because they just fought over this. Is it like being number 28 in the Royal Rumble? Because being number 30 in the Royal Rumble did not produce nearly as many winners as you would think it would. So now we go through this match. Drew McIntyre's out there. He's the champ. He's having a match. He's having a match and a half with AJ Styles. And I loved this, man. This is something that should have already been its own rivalry months ago. Instead of sticking us with Drew versus Randy for fucking months after month after month, Drew versus AJ could have been money in the bank, not the pay-per-view, actual money in the bank. And it was proven by watching them take on each other tonight in this gauntlet match. Great match. Great match. By the time we got to the end, AJ Styles was in there almost 30 minutes, and he would end up losing to the champion, Drew McIntyre, who moved on to face Jeff Hardy. And now this would be another long-ass gauntlet match. You know how the gauntlet match usually features like at least one really quick uh, elimination that seems like a schmoz or seems like a squash of some point? This had that too. This had that too, but not so much to the extent as the others. And every match that actually went on as planned, you'll understand what I mean by that in a minute, went way over 10 minutes. He fought Jeff Hardy. I felt like I was watching them fight forever. I thought Drew McIntyre was out there almost for the entirety of that final hour, which is, you know, kudos to him. It's a real testament to how much this guy can go. Drew McIntyre has gotten the shit end of the stick as champion. He's been the champion through probably the worst period of wrestling that there will ever be because there's no fans. There's, you know, no involvement, no interaction. Everything just feels different. And it's just, it's a shame because I feel like if things were normal, Drew's championship run might be a lot more welcomed 
by a lot of people. You would be hearing the crowd reactions. You would be feeling all the emotions with him instead of just watching people on screen like watching TV at home. Like it's 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 unfortunate for him. He's getting a bad rap because he's been a a decent champion during a terrible time period in wrestling, and the only real things wrong with his title run is the booking. And he's not in charge of the booking. I think he's been a good champion. He's done the best he could do with what he's given. And tonight he was given Randy Orton again after Jeff Hardy. Drew McIntyre took out Jeff Hardy. I didn't think he was going to make it past Jeff Hardy. But I was pulling for him to run the gauntlet now because I don't want my champions losing. If you're a longtime fan of this show, which you probably are if you're still watching me at 35 minutes, you know that's one of my biggest pet peeves ever. Champions should be booked as champions and their shoulders should not hit the mat unless they are dropping the title to the incumbent champion. That should be a fucking rule. <laughs> really should. So after he takes out Jeff Hardy with a Claymore kick, he gets to Randy Orton. He's out there with Randy Orton for about a minute and a half, maybe two minutes, when Alexa Bliss shows up all over the place. See, Alexa Bliss earlier in the evening was sitting in the back on a pentagram and, you know, being all creepy, you know, the whole supernatural portion of the show. We didn't really get any hints on when, but she's saying that he, he being the fiend, is most likely on his way back. He's being reborn. I'll believe it when I see it. This weird Randy Orton versus Alexa Bliss feud has gone way off the rails. It started off mildly interesting, but as soon as Bray Wyatt was taken out of the scenario, everything else just kind of sucked. And it's because of things like this. Twisted Bliss shows up on every monitor in the Thunderdome, on the Tron, on the little scoreboard thingy up overhead. And Randy Orton, Randy Orton, the viper, the sadistic, serial killer-like apex predator, gets counted out because he's too busy staring at evil Alexa Bliss all over the Thunderdome. What? Absolutely ridiculous, which leads us to the final spot in the gauntlet match where Sheamus, Shamey McSpeakeasy, he attacked Drew McIntyre from behind before the match could get started, laying him out, giving himself a decided advantage. The ref started the match. Sheamus took control. Next thing you know, McIntyre misses a Claymore kick. Shamor, uh, Shamor. <laughs> Sheamus follows it up with a bro kick and gets the pinfall win. And Sheamus will be the last one to enter the Elimination Chamber. After the match, Sheamus told Drew, you can't beat me, and he will become the new WWE Champion. The only thing I learned from this gauntlet match is that my original prediction, or my original gut feeling going into the Elimination Chamber this Sunday, was that Randy Orton was going to come out victorious. He was going to beat Drew McIntyre and take the title into WrestleMania, possibly versus Edge, to continue that feud. That's what I thought WWE logic would force us to have to watch. This going the way that it did makes me kind of lean a little bit a little bit more towards Sheamus winning the chamber this Sunday, establishing Drew versus Sheamus at WrestleMania, but that would leave Edge only to fight Roman, which is probably not my first choice, and just really screws everything up. We talked about it on the other shows, how the Elimination Chamber has been ruined by the fact that Edge didn't choose his opponent, and it is not being used properly. This is something you're probably going to hear on many other shows, because wrestling fans respect wrestling more than wrestling writers, and we know what's best for business way more than what they do. This show, especially as a go-home show for the Elimination Chamber, was an absolute nightmare. And not a good nightmare like me, one of those bad feverish dream nightmares that you have 
that you want to wake up from immediately, only this you can't wake up. Because it it's there. It's there. Oh, why don't you just not watch it? Well, I'm a wrestling fan. I'm a WWE fan. And I can't help myself. It's like a drug. It's like a drug. It really is. I know it's going to be bad. I know it's bad for me. But I can't stop watching it. Because deep down inside, I hope for the turn every single week. I hope to see a glimmer of hope that says we're going to turn it around. You know what that glimmer of hope was this week? Vengeance Day. I don't watch NXT anymore. I haven't in a long time. But I wanted to see Finn Balor versus Pete Dunne. These are two of my favorites. Two of my favorites of the new crop of pro wrestlers that I have come across in the last couple of years. Needed to see this match. Very glad to see it. It felt good to enjoy watching wrestling again. It gets my, my blood going. I just felt great watching Vengeance Day. And then 24 hours later, I got to sit down and watch Raw and remember everything that's wrong with the state of pro wrestling right now. And it's, it's just a goddamn nightmare. And I don't think the Elimination Chamber is going to be worth our time at all. It's doing nothing to set us up on the road to WrestleMania. It is not being used the way it should be at all. And this go-home show is proof of it. When Bad Bunny wins the 24-7 championship, you know things are bad. That's all I have to say about Monday Night Raw. This went longer than I even expected it to go. I thought I was going to hammer right through this and get done, but man, this show pissed me off. So it's going to be one of the longer episodes that we had in a while. Thank you all for sticking through it with me if you're still here. And thank you all for supporting this channel all throughout the year. Now it's time for you to do your part and help us out the best way you can. And that's by hitting that thumbs up. It really does help out the channel more than you can imagine. Share this video with each and every one of your wrestling buddies all over the wrestling world. Especially if you think they'd have a good time doing what we do here. Talking about pro wrestling tonight. Drop me a comment in the comment section. Let me know what you thought about tonight's shit show of a go-home show. And maybe what was your favorite part. If you could think of a favorite part, let me know what it was. If your favorite part was Bad Bunny, let me know. I'm not going to I'm not gonna destroy you. I'm not going to kill you. I understand. If you're a fan of the guy, you're a fan of his music, you're really excited. I'm none of those things. So I'm not excited. I don't care. And now he's the 24-7 look at me. Hey, I don't give a shit. I'm a clown avocado champion. And that's not a good look on anybody except... For our truth. My name is Nick Nightmare. This is the team Thor the Sledgehammer, the official Sledgehammer of the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show. His tag team partner, the World Heavyweight Champion of all the microphones in all the world, and the only World Heavyweight Championship microphone in all of YouTube, Mr. Blue, the Snowball Microphone. Most important member of the team, as always, each and every one of you guys. If you missed anything from our Royal Rumble review to the SmackDown hammerings and everything in between, it will be linked in the annotations up above thank you guys always for being here love you guys so much that's going to do it we are out of here and we will see you friday night for smackdown right here on your new favorite wrestling show the sledgehammer wrestling show only on sledgehammer tv right here on youtube.com <laughs> Thanks, Vince. Oh.